in the past if you've attended some of our other webinars on this topic. And it's actually a panel discussion, which will give you an opportunity to interact directly with two of our leaders that have been working with the large uh, Fortune 500 enterprises that we've had the privilege in the last uh, uh, several years of working with, specifically helping them advance their objectives with regard to enterprise data warehouse modernization. So it will be a panel discussion. Uh, we have teed up some questions, which are the most frequently asked questions that we get from uh, uh, customers as we're working uh, through that with them. But there is also the opportunity for you through the panel on your screen to enter your own questions. We have time set aside at the end for interactive Q&A, and that's always one of the most exciting parts of our webinars. And we do these uh, fairly frequently. I'll take a minute here and just to tell you a little bit more about Impetus if you're not familiar with us. And our overall mission is to create powerful and intelligent enterprises. And we, and we do that by working with our prospects and customers uh, on deep data, building deep data enterprise data awareness, solutions for deep data integration, and helping to position them to leverage the opportunities that exist today in deep advanced data analytics. Uh, having said that, uh, we've developed a, a wide range of both products uh, and uh, solutions. The products uh, give us the opportunity to really provide tools and accelerators uh, with regard to advancing the cause of the big data uh, analytics journey, the journey into what most people refer today as the modern data warehouse. And again, some of the uh, largest and most well-known uh, uh, leading companies of the Fortune uh, 200 our companies that we have worked with and the experiences we'll be sharing today are really from that. Uh, if you look at the breadth of services and uh, tools that we offer, it really is uh, represents a full, psych a full life cycle set of, uh, of, of value that we're able to deliver beginning with uh, transformation, whether that be from, uh, from the legacy EDW to the big data in the cloud or on-prem, through the phase which we refer to as unification, addressing both uh, uh, real-time and streaming data as well as batch data processing, preparation, data blending, and addressing the requirements, very important requirements surrounding uh, governance. In the area of analytics, uh, we do have a complete uh, data science practice and capabilities in our various tools to address both batch and real-time analytics, machine learning, deep learning, AI, and a lot of exciting things going on there, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And lastly, with regard to BI consumption on top of our data lakes or the big data, uh, uh, big data warehouse environment, as you may have implemented it, and we have uh, capabilities through a partner of our, or a, a sister company called Kybos Insights, where we offer low latency BI at massive scale uh, natively in Hadoop or the big data environment in the cloud of your choice. So it is a full life cycle set of offerings that represents the experience that we've had and we'll be sharing with you today. Um, that's a little bit about uh, impetus and who we are. And we're gonna open now with a, a polling question, which you'll, you'll see here in a minute on your console. And the poll will actually remain open um, for the, the next 15 minutes. And the poll, as you uh, see it there on your screen, what is the primary environment you are planning for your modern data warehouse, whether that is primarily cloud-based, primarily on-prem, or if it will be a, balanced, uh, a balance of both through a hybrid implementation or you're really undetermined at this point, and it says none of the above, probably more appropriately, you know, undetermined at this time. But that poll will re remain open uh, for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, and we'll look forward to sharing the results of that with you at the close of the poll. Uh, I'd like now to introduce our panel of speakers. Uh, these are two of the, the leaders within Impetus. Venkat Chakravarti actually leads our modern data architecture practice. He has over 25 years of industry experience in big data analytics, uh, data warehousing, ETL, business intelligence, and he regularly collaborates with CIOs of leading Fortune 500 companies, acting as a, a strategic advisor, an architect, a strategist, helping them gain new business insights through a better and deeper understanding of their enterprise data. 
Uh, with him is Hari, Hari Kotakala. Hari is our Director of Big Data Strategy, and he's responsible also for working directly with customers, uh, consulting with them, and helping them build innovative solutions to leverage uh, the big data analytics opportunity. He's an art, articulate thought leader and a regular speaker at uh, events on the topics of big data and cloud strategies, advanced analytics, and uh, in, most importantly, how large enterprises can drive more value in their journey into becoming real-time data-driven enterprises. Uh, again, urge you to interact with that poll, and uh, at this time we'll uh, give you an opportunity to hear from both Venkat and Hadi on the topic of uh, the questions that we'll be addressing for today's event. And the first one says, uh, what has traditionally been the primary role of the enterprise data warehouse? What is the role, how is that role changing in today's world? What new requirements do enterprises need to address in this age of the, quote, modern data warehouse? And Venkat, if you'd take the lead in addressing this opening question. Thank you, Larry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, to start with, I would like to say that traditionally EDW has been the backbone of analytics with most of the enterprises, whether they are Fortune 10 companies, Fortune 1000 companies, or smaller uh, industries, they still have been the backbone of the analytics. Uh, users across the board run mission-critical applications on them, and have come to trust the reports and the alerts and the other dashboard information that they get from EDW to run their day-to-day -day business. The, one of the reasons being is EDW has offered a very strong framework for decision making, allowing them to do deep analytics, predictive models, and other types of uh, business-related uh, analytics that has helped them over the years. Performance of these analytics has been very stable, very mature, and people have come to trust on them. But all these things started changing around like last five years back, okay? Organizations suddenly have now started to depend on social media sensor data to get a competitive edge. So what it means is volumes of data has been coming in, velocity is changing, and the veracity of the word data is also changing at warp speed. EDW vendors, don't get me wrong, are trying to catch up to this trend, right? Both the big guys like Teradata and the Oracles and the IBMs are really trying to get there, but they are still working from a relational framework and not from this open source framework. So they're still catching up and they are not there. One of the other big factors that has happened is the cloud has come into picture, the open source distros have come into picture, and they have thrown in this new set of technologies and innovations that are also coming up at rapid speed, okay? so. The modern data warehouse now needs to not only address these new requirements of volume, velocity, and veracity, but they have to contend with this innovation of solutions and technologies and to be able to use them in the right sense. A balance has to be struck while doing all these innovations and new, new applications between cost and usage, because the cost, cost has been IT budget and business budgets have been going down while the requirements have been going up. So it, it's, it's a total balance between uh, cost and usage. I'm going to now ask my co-presenter co here, uh, panelist, Hari, to give you your thoughts on this. Uh, thank you, Venkat. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I would add uh, the modern data warehouse requirements uh, have also become more complex, uh, uh, like very much what you said, Venkat, and uh, there is an ever-increasing wish list of analytics based on technologies like AI, machine learning, NLP, for exploring new ways of working with data and uh, getting the more advanced insights. 
likewise, uh, the open source uh, development uh, is also in high gear. We, we see a lot of these innovations uh, addressing some of these complexities. Uh, this consistently adds to the increased expectations uh, on the current EDW across the board because of that. Uh, Larry? Larry? Great, thank you, Hadi. Uh, the next question we'd like to address is uh, what is the retrospective view of the current EDW transformation landscape? How are enterprises doing today in their pursuit of EDW modernization and some of, the uh, some of these challenges that they are facing? And think it, if you would take the lead for that. Sure, uh, Larry. The transformation landscape is scattered across all over the place. What I mean by that is enterprises can be uh, uh, at, at either extremes or even to the point that pockets of the enterprises within an enterprise could be at different extremes. There could be certain departments that are very mature and then there are certain departments are just starting to use this modern uh, warehouse environment, okay? So if you, if the way we categorize them is into four major categories. And some of them is going to be, some of the enterprises are going to be like between uh, these categories. And as I said, some enterprises could have multiple categories within their environment too. So the, the number one we want to talk about is the, the enterprises or pockets of enterprises that are, uh, that are mature. Uh, what do we mean by that? These are the early adapters of the big data environment. They started early, they worked through the kings with their IT and the business. Now IT and business work very well together. Business is getting their requirements filled in a very processed environment because IT has been able to adapt to this environment, move some of their best practices from EDW into this so that they are able to work very efficiently. But there are, uh, there are not a lot of them. And as I said, there are pockets within the en enterprise that are there, but there are still pockets that are still trying to get there. Then the next category that we, we look at is the, are the innovators. These are typically business-driven uh, enterprises where they identify a use case or an opportunity and they use big data and the relevant solutions to bring value to the company. They have use cases that have been very profitable to the enterprise. They are able to churn out analytics that actually make a difference in their day-to-day -day uh, business deals. But they are, as we said, they are only contained to certain pockets of an enterprise. They are not widely participated across the enterprise. Their goal is to become an enterprise-wide, but because the nature of their innovations, they are using new technologies and new solutions for just an opportunity and probably not taking much value outside that particular opportunity. Then the third one, these are, the, uh, these are enterprises that are, I would call them very crudely to say that these are guys who have been forced to adapt. Uh, and some of the factors of their adoption has been typically like mandate, compliance mandated. They need to be storing huge amounts of huge historical information and be able to run certain analytics after seven years of how it ran seven years back, those kind of stuff. They are federally mandated or state mandated compliance requirements. There are also guys who have just started using the big data as an archival strategy. Then there is, they are also forced because uh, certain uh, traditional legacy and uh, legacy environments are going to end of life. For instance, uh, IBM announced that Netiza would not be supported after June of 2019, and they are using that opportunity to move into big data. Then the last one that we are talking about are the late adapters. These are very conservative uh, and, uh, enterprises. They do not want to be any leaders. Forget about leaders. They don't want to be the next followers either. They want to make sure that big data is here to stay, and then they would start inv investing in them. They have their advantages, and they have their disadvantages. 
but that's the kind of people that's the kind of enterprises they want to be con confirmed before they can put their money in now all these guys have challenges okay the main challenges that we see predominantly whichever maturity model you are is the organizational uh, inertia what i mean by that is organizations are so big that they take time to turn they have had been investing in traditional legacy that they don't feel that they should be moving into new stuff then there is that internal politics and things like that that you know they don't want to accept it exists so the organizational uh, inertia is a very very big challenge that all enterprises fa uh, face then the businesses want them to uh, come up with new features but they don't want to give up what they are used to and they don't want to be paying additional stuff for this so there is this ROI to move into new technology that is a big battle within the enterprises even though at the c level people are saying we need to go into uh, big data okay the balancing the scale and the speed of ad adoption is a bigger factor too because things happen in this world in the new world at a much more rapid pace we are not dependent on a single vendor to give us innovation the open source innovates everybody wants to do what they want to do another big factor that people are really not a, uh, are really facing in this world is how do i take my current skill set and move it into the new world there are multiple thoughts people say that hey the old skill set needs to be gone but the new skill set have to be acquired so i need to go and recruit a lot of people i think the balance lies somewhere in the middle and we'll talk about it as we move forward on that uh, and manifesting certain data management processes that are being used in the legacy how do we do that in the new environment that's a huge challenge governance metadata lineage those are things that they have to face and the biggest challenge always comes is what is the right technology stack that we need to adapt for an enterprise versus a bespoke architecture so even some large banks i have seen that we are currently working with and are working with they have multiple technologies that they started in multiple streams now they have come to a point where they have to say let's stop and make sure that we are able to consolidate this and then the challenges that are arising out of those consolidation okay so there is a whole lot of consolidation going on while there is a lot of innovation going on so it, it you, you know it is a chaos in some cases but they are getting a lot of value out of this chaos because businesses are making business decisions at a much more latent space but they are also having this confusion about skills about technology about politics and where do we need to be in the long run hari you want to add something more uh i think venkat you did touch upon some of it but uh, i would also bring this uh, uh aspect of the mature adopters even they face significant challenges like the big banks like you're talking about for excellent in putting processes in place they just struggle with the impact of their initial choices and decisions that can lead to significant technical debt uh, and uh, they end up running efficient silos uh about different distros in some cases and then uh, there there is a good uh, maybe silo performing however they lose out on the collective synergy that they expect to benefit from interesting hari interesting hari while you're uh, while you've got the the podium here why don't you go ahead i know our audience would be very interested in what are some of the best practices that we've seen emerging from these projects we've been involved with um excellent question larry i know uh um so i i would uh, quickly summarize that uh, in in brief bullets uh, in say like uh, accelerate through transformation uh, accelerate your transformation through automation actually and uh, bring strategic integration and then apply a phased approach driven by comprehensive data management and what i mean by that is uh, what i'm saying is 
uh, transform your existing implementation and move it into the cloud or an on-prem technology of your choice in an accelerated fashion by taking advantage of automation that's available out there. Uh, we strongly advise uh, not to use brute force of the manual conversion uh, because what our experience has taught us uh, in this space is the effort is not worth the risk, which the automation tools really have solved it for you, and that will really give you the acceleration very easily. Uh, also, from a strategic integration standpoint, ensure that the integration of these technologies into your environment is in a more plug-and-play fashion and not dependent on huge re-engineering development cycles uh, that may lead to a, a whole new uh, set of unplanned disruptions uh, that becomes uh, challenging from a man uh, to manage uh, if not uh, thought through strategically from the get-go. Um, data management definitely should be a very core component of the phase transformation, transformation approach as uh, the legacy data management practices that are in there, you could take that to improve and move into these new technologies uh, in a uh, coherent fashion, and it is also a critical piece of the puzzle to get it right. Uh, in the same concept, lockstep with that, implementing metadata and lineage practices, uh, it is usually what we have seen is an afterthought in, in a lot of these initiatives, whereas we would say having that upfront is uh, extremely important, and applying it in an end-to-end -end fashion, all the way from your ingestion to the consumption uh, of the platform of your modernized uh, data warehouse modernization initiative is very, very productive. While also uh, one of the things I would also bring up at this point is uh, closely watching and avoiding proliferation of the past bad practices that you are already aware of. You have to watch out and not take it into your new environment. You have to definitely uh, keep an eye on that because uh, that risk uh, can pop up if uh, you're not looking uh, closely to what you're migrating. Like because that might slow down your uh, utilization and the benefits that you want to derive uh, from the new modernized platforms. So, so Hari, uh, great summary to add on to what uh, Hari says here, right? We have seen many organizations struggling between totally re-engineering what they currently have in the new environment because they think that nothing is going to work that was working in traditional warehouses. And where, while there is a whole set of people who just, in the interest of time and in the, because they have good knowledge of what is happening, just want to take what is currently running in their current EDWs and move that into uh, the big data environment. Whether it is on cloud or on-prem, they just want to move that. But, but the most efficiency lies somewhere in the middle, right? You do not want to totally re-engineer, but you also do not want to take what is exactly right there now and shift it into the new environment. What you want to do is, and this is, we have done both, right? Over the years, we have done both. We have also done the, the lift and shift as well as we have done the re-engineering. Uh, but, so now, after years of learning, what we are advocating is somewhere in the middle. Okay, a balancing act that actually transforms, not just translates what, were, what is there because the business requirement and the business process are still the same, right? So you want to transform that into the new technology rather than just translate. But at the same time, you don't want to go through a whole set of re-engineering because some of the knowledge of how these applications and use cases were uh, put in place, Many people have left. There is no more documentation of how things were happening. Even if the initial documentation was there, uh, there have been so many iterations of changes that the, or, the original requirements to what is currently effective has changed. So we, we advocate a, a transformation of the whole thing rather than either a lift and shift or a total uh, re-engineering. Uh, to add to that, we bring to the table, right, again, we bring to the table processes and techniques through our products that will actually enable you to do that in a very accelerated manner. 
one of the major stuff that we do get is also that we are able to uh, make sure that the existing skill sets are easily transferable. Larry? Uh, ex excellent, Venkat. Thank you for that. Uh, I know that with all of these different uh, com somewhat complex trade-offs being made, all the different uh, considerations that need to come into uh, this type of a, a, a this scope and scale of uh, transformation in these large enterprises uh, easily uh, the question easily comes up you know how do I get my arms around this to begin with where do I get started and Hadi I was wondering if you've got any suggestions uh, on that Certainly, Larry. Uh, I think that that's the key question everybody wonders when they're taking up on these initiatives. So the most logical step is, of course, uh, the starting point that we recommend uh, for this transformation is an end-to-end -end assessment of their current environment that they're planning to uh, transform. And uh, so knowing all the uh, in-depth details of their existing inventory of workloads, would be definitely the first step. And there is a reason why I say that is because the assessment essentially helps qualify and quantify a whole gamut of uh, different areas that are very, very critical for success. Um, basically, they will help in charting a much more optimal roadmap and uh, also start mitigating some of the pitfalls that might cause some hurdles in the success and, and down the line as you can start getting into the exercise of uh, this transformation. So when, uh, when we couple it with the automated approach uh, through this assessment, it definitely gives a good time to value uh, and also gets rid of long development and testing and validation cycles uh, when we have uh, more time spent on the assessment and the, and the front itself. Further, it lays a very strong foundation for the transformation of the, to the into the modern landscape. Uh, besides, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Besides just the understanding the environment, it also helps you identify and categorize critical SLA priorities. Because as the new environment uh, expectations are to match that or beat that, so all those performance. Uh, challenges that may or may not exist start becoming apparent through the assessment and that will save a lot of cycles during the migration process and the transformation process as uh, things move on forward into the uh, transformation step but and uh, if i had to simply articulate this uh, this you could actually as you get started i would put it in a four step process where we say assess where it is like no before you go it's also that question for you uh, transform is you can basically get your optimum code generation, optimum uh, patterns identified and implemented, and uh, all the migration of your data schema rationalized uh, for the target environment. Uh, the third step would be validate, which basically confirms all the expectations from the new environment, making sure you are getting what you are expecting. and and also match and beat your SLAs, um, which is what is a typical uh, expectation. Uh, and lastly, execute, where which is the last step and the final step of a clean cutover into a modern data warehouse landscape with full confidence and all and with no risk. Uh, Venkat, would you like to add anything beyond this? Uh, I'm good. Uh, I think you covered everything, Larry. Okay, great. We're about to close the poll uh, at this time. You'll see the results of it uh, there on your screen right now. You'll recall the question was, what is the primary target environment that you're looking at? For 17%, uh, it was a primarily cloud-based uh, solution. You see 12% are staying with an exclusively on-prem solution. But the vast majority, and this certainly will be our experience in working with uh, the, the projects that we have is that the hybrid is the preferred approach. And 2% are still, frankly, trying to figure it out. It's not a simple uh, question that's being asked, but that's uh, a pretty typical two-thirds of the respondents saying that hybrid cloud really is the way that we'd like to go. Uh, we have another poll, which I'd like to introduce at this time, 
And basically what it is asking is uh, whether you have identified any tools to accelerate or automate or boost the productivity and effectiveness of your journey. That will stay open for a little bit of time here while we move on to uh, our next question. would ask you to respond to the poll and would also remind you that you have the opportunity to send your questions and we'll address those at the close of today's webinar. The next question uh, then, as you see it on the screen, as you, see, as you will see it on the screen, is there any tooling available today to automate or accelerate that, uh, that uh, 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 modernization uh, process? And, and Hadi, if you'd jump in and address that. Uh, thanks, Larry. Uh, so yeah, certainly there are tools available. And, uh, and as this is a pretty compelling challenge to go after, and uh, there are different vendors catering to different areas of this process of modernization. Uh, there are vendors who are only providing uh, tools that are efficient for migration of data and schema. There are some vendors that are excellent at providing CDC functionality, the incremental loads into these new environments uh, while rationalizing the data. Uh, but there are not that many vendors who can bring a, a very good balance of automation and guarantees of an end-to-end -end transformation uh, through that automation and uh, reducing the risk for customers. So that is uh, one of the things among the tools. Uh, so th that is also where Impetus has seen an opportunity, and uh, we have our accelerators that provide that guarantee of an end-to-end -end transformation through automation. Um, and there is a reason why I say that is uh, because Impetus started, there is some history, uh, as we have been doing this for quite some time. Impetus started working with client migrations uh, way back in 2010, uh, where the approach was primarily a brute, fo brute force approach, and uh, we would get a bunch of engineers uh, for every engagement, that, and people in that pool would be like, they knew the relational and the Hadoop world. They would start rewriting and writing the additional pieces of code, testing it, the validating it, making sure everything works, expectations are met. But this was a huge effort, uh, given the transitionary nature of the environment itself, because uh, as you know, big data has been an emerging space and rapidly emerging space. So there were a lot of uh, uh, expected features, enterprise readiness features that were gaps, and they had to be filled. And this was a huge effort from a time and cost perspective. So what we started seeing is, but as we kept completing these projects, we were seeing these repeating patterns across our customers. And we were doing these some of the activities redundantly. And that was kind of the seed of where we started building automation around these patterns to, in order to make ourselves more efficient in helping our customers. And which brings us to today. And what we have come up to with today is that the accelerators that we have, they give our current customers a big leapfrog advantage uh, from what we built in the in this process, and it is battle tested. It's a truly, uh, it's a true accelerator uh, that will deliver a risk-free way of transforming the EDW for a modern enterprise data platform. And uh, we have eliminated the risk uh, by accelerating uh, a lot of those. Uh, key aspects within the four-step process that I talked about, the transfer, like the transformation, the validation, and uh, even the assessment for that matter. And that, that kind of gives a very, very powerful tooling to get into these initiatives without really having to worry about the risk that customers face. To, to add on to what uh, Hari is saying, right, people, enterprises have uh, looked into uh, uh, specific uh, providers that only handle the next generation of ETL or the next generation of data migration or CDC or all of these things. But what what is lacking, as Hari well pointed out, is an end-to-end -end strategy. One thing I do want to add to that is that enterprises have invested, even in the newer technologies, with multiple vendors that are very specific to their silo needs. So for instance, people have invested in data governance. People have invested in new versions of uh, ETL tool, uh, tools, right? 
But what is ha or the new versions of uh, B uh, consumption BI uh, stuff? But what is happening is all of these vendors are bringing in their own uh, best practices and things like that. But there is no connection between each other. Not that they are not trying to partner or anything, but they are vividly so different that partnering really does not work from end to end. This is one of the things that Impetus bring to, our, to the table due to our experience in the, uh, in the services industry that we, we are able to work with our uh, enterprises on frameworks where they could actually do a plug and play. Okay, so, so to, today they may have made a decision to continue with their legacy ETL and I've invested heavily on that, but they are trying figuring out that it is not really worth it. Then they need to move to a new verse, new generation of ETL tools, but they are so much ingrained with the older technology that it becomes a huge effort. So what we have done with many of our enterprises is we have encapsulated this dependency and moved it to a higher level where we have built frameworks that things can work seamlessly along with our acceleration, along with our other solutions, so that as and when uh, enterprises want to change to a next generation, the framework still stays and they are able to plug and play. Now, this is a, at a very high level what I'm saying, but we have achieved so much success in this framework building that folks have been able to retire uh, certain dependencies and plug in the new one, but they know what the target needs to be because of this framework. And if so, folks are interested, we can go into that on a separate conversation on those two. Larry? Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have closed the uh, last poll and you can see the results of that on your screen now, that approximately one-third have either developed or found tools which they're using, but two-thirds have said no, we have not. And there's a huge opportunity for those individuals that have not uh, to leverage uh, automation in today's world, and there are tools available. We've made several references to the importance of the assessment stage, and the next question that we have uh, relates uh, to that. Obviously, one of the important steps in inputs to defining our roadmap is having a deep understanding of the current workloads. And Hadi, I was wondering if you could take us through a discussion of uh, some of the uh, tools that may be available and insights that are required to help our customers better understand and profile their current EDW workloads before they get started on this journey. Uh, certainly, Larry. Uh, uh, building upon what I talked earlier as well, like the first step is the assessment part, and that assessment is uh, is wh where you gain most of the insights. Uh, so, from a tooling perspective, uh, like I said, with it and the automation that we have, Impetus, the Impetus has a workload uh, transformation assessment module, which can basically parse through the uh, customer's EDW environment uh, and provide a whole gamut of information and profile all their workloads and give them a lot of in-depth analysis that will be very, very critical. The, and the assessment can be done in multi, multiple ways to get those insights. Um, and it doesn't have to be very intrusive into their environment through live connections to the database. However, it is possible to connect to, if, it, if, if it's allowed, it can be done that. Uh, or it can be done in a non-intrusive fashion using offline query logs and uh, uh, taking uh, parsing their code, parsing all the scripts that they have that, comp that comprise of the overall gamut of workload that they have. And uh, using that, what the automated analysis, once it is executed on that, it provides a valuable gamut of insights with respect to how their consumption pattern is, what applications are, how the applications are using resources, how their users are using resources on their EDW environment, how their queries are operating, and all the various entities that are actually in, in use versus what entities they have in the, like a hot data, cold data context. Because all these metrics that are available, they really help devise an effective uh, transformation strategy with, uh, and also sets up the foundation for a good 
set of comprehensive recommendations across all the dimensions that we talked about, like the SLAs that they want to meet, any potential performance challenges that they want to mitigate, uh, all those uh, challenges that are typical of uh, these transformation projects, they can actually get addressed uh, efficiently. Likewise, also, what target environments will be most conducive for their success can be identified and mapped out. And this is more relevant for enterprises where they have older systems and a lot of the over the years they have built out and may they may or may not have a good handle of the entire environment uh, but just they have things running to keep the lights on and at the same time for customers who want to you know surgically identify what would be the scope of this transformation and what they would like to leave in their old environment and in the current DW environment and it can really help both ways uh, Back to you, Larry. Excellent. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, clearly, having taken a data-driven approach to developing that uh, roadmap, and given that we saw two-thirds of the audience is operating without such automation tools today, is a huge opportunity to reduce the risk of these massive uh, migration projects. Um, I think the audience would be very interested in understanding where are some of the major benefits um, that uh, they're uh, seeing as a result of that some of the returns uh, and so forth, and then once the assessment is complete, you know, in looking back, what are some of the big uh, the big benefits they've gained? Um, certainly, I mean, the assessment is uh, like I said is the fundamental foundational step for this, and uh, following the same portrait paradigm, uh, like we talked. Um, Moving on to the transform, transformation, validation, and execution, enterprises can uh, radically transform uh, and take their current workload to an uh, to the environment of choice, be it on-prem or cloud, in a phase-wise manner. Is how usually it uh, it really pans out for uh, for the performance reasons, and likewise also to help. Uh, uh, transform in a more uh, systemic fashion without really exposing to too much risk. Now, uh, in that same process, what uh, the transform step that would take care of is uh, transforming all the queries, the scripts, the EDL logic. Because when when we are talking about EDW workloads, there are a whole gamut of things that happens in an EDW. It's not just the mere querying of data. There's a lot of ETL and there is. Uh, all kinds of different types of characteristics of workloads that are in play and identifying them and converting and taking them into the target engines of choice. So like it could be automatically uh, making it work with Spark, making it work with Hive if uh, it's going in Hadoop. And likewise, the procedural aspects of their business code, which is very, very critical, right? I mean, taking your uh, years of work that is logged in their business code all has to work, and those procedures, those uh, procedural aspects of their code also has to be uh, transformed in a systemic way. So using, depending on the choice of the technology, of course, uh, tools can, we, we, our accelerators can take that to Java, Scala, Python, whatever makes sense and what is uh, the choice of the customer. And uh, likewise, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the insights on the performance of query, since they are known upfront, the, they can be planned and delivered for the target environment uh, with the specific strategies, and likewise also used for capacity planning of the target environments, depending on where they're going. Um, these transformation pipelines that get created in this process uh, can enable also the migration of the schemas, the data views. Uh, also migration of the uh, historical data and rationalizing it for the target environment. Those are the next steps, essentially. And uh, apply all the validation rules, business rules, the consistency checks, reconciliation frameworks that Benkert was talking about earlier, a bit uh, in the beginning of this conversation for correctness and the meaningfulness of the migrated workloads. So all these steps will actually follow, and uh, they have to be all the – I's have to be dotted and the T's have to be crossed uh, kind of a way. Uh, and a lot of automation that goes into this uh, can deliver it really reliably. Excellent, Hari. Thank you so much. Uh, having done all of that, why don't you take us through some of the successes we've seen, some of the benefits uh, and results along the way? 
Certainly. Uh, so when we talk about the benefits enterprise uh, get out of this is essentially, uh, like I said, one of the key benefits is the risk mitigation. Like I said, brute force manual methods do work as well. It's not like they don't. There are a lot of uh, SIs who can deliver the same. But the consistency of the transformation that automation brings and also the capabilities that uh, the impetus workload transformation solutions have, which is basically it has a learning engine in it. And it goes, it spans beyond just the data where uh, the EDW code and EDW business logic. It can also look at the ETL processes, third party ETL tools that are supporting it. And all that gets converted as well. It is a faster process. It's cheaper. Uh, it's a faster process in terms of the magnitude, uh, the, in terms of time. It can get done almost four times faster. And uh, also, it will be very cost effective. It will be relatively, from a, compared to a manual transformation, you, you will require less labor. You will require lesser uh, uh, resources in certain ways where you get optimization of the automation. And we have done this successfully for a whole gamut of uh, organizations uh, in the top Fortune 500, large financial organizations. Uh, they have transformed their Teradata. Um, of course, then also the automation takes away all the uh, risks through so in the development, testing, and validation. Uh, we have done this for multiple different data EDW environments for customers also, like uh, Natiza, Vertica, and into an on-prem Hadoop environment as well as in the cloud. So our success stories span across all different verticals. And practically, we, we can support every enterprise depending on their initiatives uh, and help them uh, de-risk their whole transformation initiatives. Hey, Hari, to add to that, uh, I yeah. would like to bring out one of the particular success stories, right? Because these guys were early adapters, they started on-prem. But over the period of time, they decided to become a hybrid environment. So one of the things that we brought to the table was, even though we had done the initial one on-prem, they were able to seamlessly take the, the results of those that were done on-prem to be moved into the cloud without going through an, another entire migration process or a transfer process. So what we are trying to say here is even wherever you start, it really doesn't matter. If you use the impetus way of doing stuff, they are easily transitioned to the other side. So you can start in, in on-prem, on but then move that particular workload to a cloud environment, it is easily transitioned. So what we are not only taking the risk of the original transformation, but we're also proofing you for risk against future transition. So that's a big value this particular financial institution got from when we were doing it. Again, those are the types of things that people take decisions, but you want to be futuristic in nature that you are able to do it. It goes back to our principle of plug and play. Any, any single component can, should be able to change without disrupting the whole thing because right now, with open source and all these new innovations, you are going to get new generations that are going to be more effective than what you started with. And for that, you should not either be just stuck with the older one or you don't need to do a revamp and keep spending money on the same thing again and again. So that's a huge thing that we are helping our customers with that I would like to point, Larry. Excellent, Venkat. And obviously one of the first steps that our customers face is building the business case to fund this uh, migration. Uh, do we have any tools to help them uh, with that? Okay. So from I, I would address this in two parts, right? The first part is I would just address the ROI from, a, uh, from just the transformation aspect of it. Now that ROI is dependent upon the quantum of the workloads migrated, right? Because traditionally what we have seen, and most of the analysts agree with us, is the EDW is still going to be there for a certain things that, are, that it is really good at. In prior decades, we didn't have a choice but to do everything on the EDW. So certain workloads that we were using the EDW, 
we have better solutions and that's what is happening on the cloud or on the big data and on-prem environment. So from an ROI perspective, typically that is dependent upon how much of the workload you are transitioning. I would say that we would give them a savings of 40 to 60% on these translations or transformations, uh, just about comparing it with other system integrators or any other uh, forms of solution. But what is the soft ROI on this? It is the time to market. We are able to move you four times faster that actually helps you to start doing new analytics because now your foundation is there and all the, the rigor behind the foundation is already in place. You are able to do that. Now, that is the first part. The second part is the overall ROI. Impetus provides a well-defined ROI calculator that can be very customized for a prospect or a customer in that environment. And that this we are talking about not just taking the transformation aspect, but the overall modern data uh, architecture, the platform, the tools, and all those things. So a attendees can reach out to us if they would be interested so we can work with them on an individual basis. Larry? Uh, ec excellent. Thank you, Venkat. Um, the, in, as we uh, move forward and summarize here some of the work that we've done, I know that we have, as a result of input from the different uh, clients we've been working with, have improved some of the tool sets and some of the accelerators that we offer. Maybe you could take a minute and summarize some of the most recent uh, functionality that's been added to that. Yep. Uh, so as I said, the, this is the, as the tool came out of, you know, iteratively building it out. And uh, so we are constantly making upgrades to that. And uh, we have a lot of exciting features that we have included, which even make it uh, bring the acceleration uh, even at a greater uh, level. And uh, likewise, the higher degree of automation. Uh, so quickly, if I had to say, we have added some advanced validation features for transform queries and transform workloads uh, based on diverse sample sets. Uh, also, we have a automated data-driven validation framework that has been strengthened where we, we have kind of uh, reduced the manual intervention in that. Um, uh, and uh, it is basically gives you certified code for your target environment and really gives you the confidence of taking the transform code based on the target environment that we are uh, transforming it for. Uh, likewise, it does syntactical validations. Uh, the tool is e easily verifies the, uh, the syntactical validations as well as semantic uh, correctness of the um, transform queries. Um, beyond that, we have a query performance prediction as we look at the query and uh, we look at all the uh, underlying engine-based uh, parameters. Uh, and uh, we can kind of predict some of the performance-related mitigations up front. And uh, that brings valuable insights from the target press perspective and also provides an opportunity to optimize up front as we start looking at the query itself. And that gives the pattern identification and bringing the appropriate strategy in place. Uh, there is also a very on, uh, new feature that we added within the tool, which is uh, like a notebook where as you transform queries and if you see something is not right, you could up, just edit it right there and then there in place before you actually transform it and quickly send it for auto-validation and things of that nature. And uh, also one of the uh, extensions that we are building as this engine is, has the capability within the tool to identify patterns of a, different, of a whole variety of uh, tools, just... Uh, and uh, technologies beyond EDW, and we are consistently adding uh, support for uh, tools like Informatica. We can take Informatica workflows and uh, transform that into your target big data environments to directly work there. Likewise, for Oracle Data Integrator, transforming on the consumption side for like Oracle Web Reports, we can transform them into Tableau Reports um, and uh, completely validated and done it through the automation capability, They're literally looking at the metadata of these uh, tools, of the reports and things of that nature, workflows and all that. So these are some of the real uh, new features and some exciting things are uh, uh, underway, which I don't have the liberty to discuss yet, but they, they are making this tool even more powerful in the coming months. 
Excellent. Uh, okay. Thank you, Hari. Okay. Thank you. Anything you want to add? Yeah, just to recap the whole thing, what what our accelerator and solutions bring to the table is time to market. We guarantee we take the risk away from our customers because we guarantee the time performance with equivalent resources available in either on the cloud or on the prem. And if we start on the prem and tomorrow want to move to the cloud, we are uh, our transformation will still work. Uh, we give you a lot of cost savings. We have done this multiple times with multiple customers that are huge and uh, as well as smaller ones. We have done it across multiple platforms uh, like Teradata, Oracle, the big guys, as well as the small guys like Vertica and others. Uh, and we do not only bring just the transformations, Yes, it, it will work effectively. We also allow you to build uh, your foundation. Uh, and if you have invested in two, uh, other vendors or other tools that are taking care of silos, we are able to give you a framework that will integrate that, that is going to be plug and play for tomorrow. Uh, if you don't have anything, we have the best practices and we are based on open source only. We are not going to ask you to do something uh, m more than what you have in the open source and where you have already invested. Uh, again, thank you for uh, for your time today. Uh, if there are any follow-up questions, uh, please let us know. We will try to answer in the meantime. Uh, Larry, you can take it from here. Yeah, we have just, uh, just a minute left. We do want to honor this original schedule, but there were several questions that came in all related to uh, which we can kind of club together into one which we'll close on here. I would ask you uh, if you do have other questions to send those in. We're always committed to provide answers to all questions that are sent in. If they're not handled live, we'll handle them over email. And I would ask you to take a minute here now as we close our webinar also to provide some ratings and feedback on what you've heard today. And we use that to improve the webinar and the future webinars that we offer. But the questions uh, several questions came in that could be lumped together into one here, Venkat, that I'll ask you and Hadi to comment on as we close. And it says, I keep hearing that the EDW is dead and the data wet lake is the path forward, and that S3 is the best place for a data lake. Uh, can you comment on this? And as I said, there were several different uh, questions that came in, but they all seem to kind of ring of this same theme. So maybe Venkat, you or Hadi would like to comment on that before we close our webinar today. And again, take a few minutes here now as we're closing to rate and provide us with feedback. Okay. So let me start and hurry, you can jump in. Uh, the, the EDW is not dead. Just like the 10, 15 years back, uh, uh, people said that the mainframe was dead. There is, a, there is a place for the EDW. The EDW is also improving. So there is going to be certain functionalities that are still going to be rendered from an EDW. A data lake is going to be part of, a major part of your new modern data architecture. S3 is a great place to have a data lake. There are other cloud providers like Azure and Google and even private cloud providers uh, that can compete there. So a cloud component, as you saw in the uh, in the poll too, two thirds are already trying to be on a hybrid environment. And when we say hybrid, it is not hybrid on cloud and then a on-prem uh, Hadoop. It is also means that hybrid on uh, something, the data lake or a certain applications on the cloud, uh, something on uh, the things on the big data on-prem, as well as a, a smaller footprint of EDW on-prem or on the cloud. So EDW is going to survive. Uh, cloud is going to play a big part in the data lake strategy, but you're going to have a hybrid of this. And as improvements are happening, things are going to become uh, a lot chaotic before it becomes clear, because now you're not dealing with a single when you are dealing with multiple options here, uh, and everybody is competing to get your business. The good news is everybody is competing to get your business, so you're going to get the best out of all these things. Uh, Hari? Yep. 
Thanks, Venkat. Uh, I would add that uh, so, uh, when they say S3 is the best place for the data lake, uh, I wouldn't completely agree with that. Uh, it all depends on uh, what you intend to get out of your platform, of, uh, what is your modern initiative, what are your priorities. And certainly S3 has a role to play in a hybrid cloud environment or a cloud-based ap approach if AWS is your environment of choice. However, you have similar choices in other cloud providers, and uh, you can really uh, – take advantage of that, but it all depends on your overall uh, strategic priorities, and that's how uh, I would uh, advise the customers uh, to start picking stacks or making those choices. Because you could get the benefits both ways, even on-prem uh, in certain ways. It all depends on what are your driving factors uh, and utilization priorities. Venkat and Hadi, thank you so much for your time today and the information that we were able to provide. would remind everyone again to uh, rate their experience. And in addition, if there's anything we can do to help you, regardless of where you're at in that journey, since we offer a full life cycle of solutions and platforms and tools, you see a reference on your screen here to the ROI calculator. Certainly our capability to offer uh, automated assessments is a great way to start for those who, of you who are at that planning stage of the journey. But uh, most of all, I'd like to just thank you all for your time. I hope you found this quite valuable. Please do rate us, and we look forward to the next time that we can interact with you. Thank you so much. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.